ಚಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋತ್ಸ ಭಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ಹಾಮೆಜ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ದ ವರ್ದಿ ಒನ್ ದ ಹೋಲಿ ಒನ್ ದ ಫುಲಿ ಎನ್ಲೈಟ್ ಒನ್ ಸಾಧು 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 So we've been working here in this class, we've been working uh, for a few weeks now on a series called a Buddhism as a Religion. And this is something that everybody like, wants to look into. It's sort of like one of the questions you always want to ask, but you never quite do. <laughs> And I had a lot of people asking about this. It happens once a year it's sort of ar around the time when we're getting close to visak people are asking what is this uh buddhism about and what is the buddhism as a religion so we are on part three and when we're sending you the pages uh now uh you can get them at this site and uh They're edited now, one, part one, part two, and part three, all in one file. So tonight we start on a section uh, that covers uh, certain topics, the freedom of thought that is in the religion, the impartiality, uh, how faith fits into the religion, how, how um, in, into the, the doctrine trust process, and how, what the position on heresy is, what the position on sciences and about miracles and ethics in society and um, the morality uh, part of it. And then I put in a couple of ad notes in it, which I probably, I hope one of you gets, pulls up the paper for me and tells me what the ad notes were, but one of them I know uh, one of them was in this, the realm of science. I, I needed to put an ad note on there, especially in reference to uh, the new developments in uh, research that completely confirm what the Buddha was teaching as far as changing a person's uh, uh, perspective of life, changing their uh, behavior It completely confirms that. And then I had another ad note, but it's slipping my mind what it is. So if someone can catch that uh, for me, when we get to the end, I'll add those two in. So we start with freedom of thought. And the Buddha's advice was not to depend on theories, on cults, or on gurus. In fact, all uh, the times that uh, we must remain masters of ourselves through self-reliance, which is extensively put forward in Buddhism. We must never surrender our dignity or free will. The Buddha strongly advocated the doctrine of self-reliance, of purity, courtesy, enlightenment, peace, and universal love. And he stressed the need for understanding because without it, psychic insight leading to wisdom cannot be obtained. And this referring to insights which cannot occur if the mind is blocked um, by the scars of misbehavior and such. He says, If you wish to see the end of your suffering and fear, develop discipline, compassion, and wisdom. We must always allow our minds the freedom to think and understand without depending on external influence. Those who depend on others are like small children. We must follow the example of the Buddha who said that when he was meditating to gain enlightenment, there were no gods who came to whisper. No one to speak in his ear. 
to reveal any hidden secrets of spiritual power. Nobody gave him any commandments or religious laws to introduce to others. He said, I never had any teacher or divinity to teach me how to gain enlightenment. What I achieved, I did by my own effort, my own energy, knowledge and purity to gain supreme wisdom. That is why he said that wisdom arose in him at his enlightenment or awakening. Wisdom is latent in all of us. We only need to provide the right conditions for it to arise. So he's saying even here, he's, he's, uh, Keshri is talking about uh, the fact that conditions lead to each one of the developments that happens in the process of the Dhamma. From the intellectual and philosophical content of Buddhism has arisen the freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry. And this has no parallel in any of the established world religions. There is no obligation, no compulsion, to believe or accept any doctrine. The approach of Buddhism is one of seeing and understanding. It is a scientific attitude of mind and fundamental philosophical doctrines taught in Buddhism are being more and more co corroborated by the new scientific discoveries of our time. Buddhism advocates self-confidence, self-restraint, self-reliance, and self-purification to the individual in society. A strong feature that is in the Buddhism is the importance that it attaches to democratic ideals and unhindered discussions are encouraged where even contrary views are aired between the people and lead to broadening and enriching of the mind. The orders of monks and nuns are constituted entirely on these democratic principles. And this is in accordance with the Dhamma revealed by the Supreme Buddha who had the openness and courage to exhort his followers, not even to accept what he himself pronounced to them. Without prior examination and conviction, in fact, the Buddha had stated that the Dharma was his teacher and all he did was to reveal the truth of this universal Dharma, which had been lain hidden from the people who were wallowing in their ignorance and suffering. He must give our minds, we must give our minds, the freedom to think without bias and to think independently. There's a section in the suttas um, where it talks about smoking out the sheds. And this is something that the follower or the monk or nun are invited to do if you hear the Dhamma taught in a wrong way, to say stop and present, at least try to present what you know of the uh, correct way of presenting the Dhamma. Before his passing away, the Buddha's final words were, be a refuge unto yourselves. Why is it that after 45 years of preaching, he uttered such words? Why did he not advise everyone to find salvation through him? What he meant was, 
that we must not seek salvation by depending on others. We must develop our own confidence in ourselves. What a wonderful and noble advice. You may perhaps now ask, why do we say, Budong Saranga Chami, I go to the Buddha for refuge. When we say this, we do not mean that we depend on the Buddha. We mean that if we follow the method taught by the Buddha, we will develop the confidence to work out our own salvation. We certainly do not think that the Buddha will come one day and take us up to heaven in a glorious flight. Some people say that the Buddha was only a human and not a god. Why should people follow him? They cannot understand that Buddhists do not expect their salvation directly from the Buddha, but by practicing the noble method that was taught by him. And the Buddha's method from the very beginning was to train us how to work for the development of self-reliance by training our minds. Self-effort, self-realization is the only path to salvation. Anyone can stand before the Buddha with dignity and not be like a slave. With hope and confidence, one can determine one's own fate. The Buddha will welcome you if you stand as a dignified human being, but you must be prepared to be reasonable and listen to sensible arguments which are contradictory to your beliefs and have right observation involved. This should be the attitude of understanding people. What he was about to pass away, when he was about to pass away, uh, many great people, princes, ministers, even divine beings came to pay homage to him with flowers. But the Buddha instructed his attendant Ananda to tell them that if anyone wanted to honor their master, they had to follow his teachings. And this shows that he did not want personal glory for himself or demand total submission to his power. Impartiality is an important part of Buddhism. After realizing the truth, understanding people try to cultivate their minds to guard and protect themselves. They neither accept nor reject what is said by someone Krishnamurti says that those who always depend on others, ideas, are second-class human beings. Don't accept and believe anything that is taught as religious practice, and at the same time, don't reject it out of either. Certain things that we accept are true as true, we may later discover to be untrue. And after all, conversely, we may be forced to admit that certain things that we rejected at first may be true after all. And that is why the Buddha has advised us to wait for a time and study think, observe, investigate, before we decide whether there is any truth in something we hear and whether to accept or to reject it. By relying on our emotions on, or blind faith or anxiety, we may accept certain things or even be skeptical. As a result of laziness and confusion of the mind, we may 
reject or disbelieve something that we hear. But we must give a chance for the mind to think and understand whether it is true or not. We are encouraged to test it. The subject of faith is in this religion. Mere faith is meaningless because faith must be tempered with the understanding that comes from training the mind. The main purpose of a religion must be to show a follower how to use his knowledge with critical understanding to maximize his sense of well-being and self-fulfillment. No matter how much knowledge we have, if we do not uproot defilements and the doubt in our minds, we will remain in an unhappy state. When we attain the highest state of purity, arahanthood, we completely uproot our cravings, our anger disappears, delusion falls away, and we establish total equanimity of the mind. It is then that the pure ones arrive at a state when they cannot create any bad thoughts anymore. They cannot utter harsh words or commit evil actions anymore. One who has purified his mind in a is a hundred times superior to those who are powerful or those who have mere faith or knowledge but still wallow in the impurities of the mind. We claim to be civilized, but how can we claim this when our minds show impure traits to the same extent as our primitive ancestors did thousands of years ago? All over the world, people crowd in temples, churches, mosques, and other places of worship to pray, do sacrifice, perform penance. But when they come out, they have the same anger, craving, jealousy, grudges, and enemy, enmity, and that they had before, before they went in. And the people claim to be religious when they pray and worship and perform religious ceremonies, but their minds remain selfish and devious in their work. If they are truly religious, they will not discriminate against others or hurt and ridicule others in other in their religious practices. The Buddha tried to open our minds to understand things perfectly without developing any fanatical religious beliefs and discrimination. The subject of heresy. Another reason why the teachings of the Buddha does not fall into the category of established religion is that there is no room for heresy in this system. A heresy is something that challenges the word of God. The Buddha freely invited both his followers and his opponents to challenge his teachings from every possible angle so that there would be no room for any kind of doubt. True to his injunctions, his followers have argued about his doctrines and even founded different schools of Buddhism according to their understanding without violence or bloodshed. In fact, at the famous Buddhist University of Nalanda, which was destroyed by at uh, the fanatical hands of other religionists, the followers of the Theravada and the Mahayana schools of Buddhism lived there together and studied and debated their different points of view in perfect 
harmony. The Buddha taught that if anyone really believed that he knew the truth, then he should not be afraid to have it challenged because the truth will always win. Moreover, he actively encouraged anyone to challenge his teachings. His replies to numerous questions enriched the doctrine into a vast religious field which was faithfully recorded by his disciples. We are today able to answer any questions about Buddhism simply by referring to the Buddha's explanations in the suttas. Rational thinking and the importance of inviting criticism are paramount to Buddhism. the science involved in Buddhism. The test of a religious teaching is in its conformity with the findings of science and the attraction that it casts on the minds of persons possessed of acute intelligence. Some religions have experienced a measure of discomfort as science unfolds its discoveries, and as a result, certain modifications or reinterpretations of their scriptures have become necessary. In this respect, Buddhism, the rational teaching of the awakened one, faces no such embarrassment as its basic principles are in close harmony with the findings of today's science. Let us study just one example. In the light of the latest studies of the atom, the old concept of the world is radically changing, just as the concept of the atom itself is changing. There is no more matter as it was believed in the past. It has been reduced to energy and even concept of energy is disappearing gradually. And the scientists themselves do not know what to call it. And they are now coming to the conclusion that the atom is only a concept and by extension that the world too is nothing but a conception. The more they make researches into the structure of the atom itself, the more they seem to be convinced of this conclusion. In Buddhism, this theory was expounded 16 centuries ago, if not earlier in the fourth century AC, the Buddhist philosopher Asangha developed a theory known as the Vinapti Matra or the Chitta Matra. It was based on the original canonical texts which enunciate that this world is just a conception, just a thought, just an idea. In order to prove this theory, Asanga had to define the atom and his definition made 1600 years ago is still valid to this day. The atom, Paramanu, should be understood as not having a physical body, Nisarira. The determination of the nature of the atom is done by the intellect through the ultimate analysis of the mass of matter. Of course, Asanga's interest was not in physics, but in metaphysical and the philosophical. His interest was to show that this world, which ordinary people take as substance, was nothing real, 
but only a concept. According to Albert Einstein, when the universe is analyzed, there is nothing which remains as substance, but only the vibrations or waves. The doctrine of Buddha Dhamma stands today as unaffected by the march of time and the expansion of knowledge as when it was first enunciated. No matter to what lengths increased scientific knowledge can extend man's mental horizon, within the framework of the Dhamma, there is room for the acceptance and assimilation of further discovery. Because this is because Buddhism does not rely for its appeal upon limited concepts of primitive minds, nor for its power upon the negation of thought. The position on miracles. Science today does not deny the possibility of miracles as it once did, but it is beginning to accept that what were known as miracles were but manifestations of phenomena that were yet unknown. The Buddha himself expounded this view. To him, miracles were not in themselves to be regarded as demonstration of truth, but showed only a mastery of little known powers that may be developed by some people. It did not necessarily follow that their possessor was an enlightened or a divine being. This being so, the Buddha not only taught his followers to be wary and careful in the exercise of any miraculous powers they might acquire, but also he warned the others not to be duly impressed by such exhibitions. And thus, whereas other religions exploit their miraculous elements to the greatest possible extent in order to convince the masses, the Buddhism treats all such things as of very minor importance and irrelevant to the real task of spiritual development and emancipation. According to the Buddha, the highest miracle is the conversion of an ignorant man to become a wise man. In this connection, Swami Vivekananda says, the idea of supernatural beings may arouse to a certain extent the power of action in man, but it also brings dependence. It brings fear. It brings superstition. It degenerates into a horrible belief in the natural weakness of the man. The scientific attitude and the content of Buddhism also led Albert Einstein to say that if there is any religion that would cope with modern scientific needs, it would be Buddhism. The position on ethics and society. The other important aspect of Buddhism as a world religion is its attitude to social, economic, and political problems. Uninformed people have generally tended to consider this religion as an escape or a withdrawal from active life, retiring into a temple or into a cave or into a forest and leading a life cut off from society. This, however, is due to a lack of understanding. For the Buddha himself was one of the hardest working persons that ever lived in this world. He slept only two and a half hours each night, and the rest of the time he worked. 
He walked the length and breadth of India, met people from all walks of life, talked to them and taught them. He did not talk about Nibbana all the time. And to everybody he met, instead he spoke according to their way of life and levels of understanding. The Buddha said that he would not expect a beginner to realize the highest noble truth at one time. He said that his was a gradual path and therefore helping people in various ways according to their standard or evolution and progress is part of this religion. An active social, economic, and political life can be separated from true religious life, cannot be separated, cannot be separated from a true religious life. In the religion of the Buddha is to be found a comprehensive system of ethics and a transcendental metaphysics embracing a sublime psychology. It satisfies all temperaments and to the simple-minded, it offers a code of morality, a gorgeous worship, and even hope for life in heaven. And to the earnest devotee, it brings a system of pure thoughts, a lofty philosophy and moral teachings that lead to an awakening and liberation from all sufferings. But the basic doctrine is the self-purification of man. Spiritual progress is impossible for him who does not lead a life of purity and compassion. In its organized form as a popularly practiced religion of the masses with the many ceremonies, processions and festivals, incorporating various customs and traditions, Buddhism provides an ample motivation, experience and material for education. Family functions, village ceremonies, cultural performances and events like births and weddings, deaths and memorial services provide education in an informal way. Children learn most of their customs, manners, cultural values, and even aspirations by observing or participating in these non-formal educational activities. Youth and adults both gain from them. Beyond the personal level and the emancipation of the individual, Buddhism recognizes the family as a unit of society and nation. And thus to the ordinary householder whose highest aim consists in gaining of material satisfaction here and going to heaven hereafter, Buddhism provides a simple code of morality as contained in the Sigilavata Sutta. The practice which will strengthen the solidarity of a community. It maintains the right relations between its family members, employers, and employees. In another discourse, the Buddha was given 10 kinds of advice for people to respect and to fulfill their duties and responsibilities towards their parents, children, husbands, and wives, relatives, elders, departed ones, devas or deities, and to live in harmony in society without becoming nuisances to the public and to lead blameless lives. 
as such a teaching has the well-being of all members of a society as its aim and provides for diligent practice of friendly action, which is the mark of a truly social being. Now, on the other hand, the advanced person who realizes the hindrances of the household life, a path defiled by, by passions, can resort to a higher code of morals and ethics as contained in the rules of the holy order known as the Vinaya. And they will enable each other to lead a life of purity, holiness, and renunciation, unfettered by mundane distractions. The subject of morality. Buddhist morality is based on freedom and understanding because morality grew out of society's need for self-preservation it must necessarily adapt itself to changing times and circumstances. Morality is therefore relative. In fact, there cannot be any morality or ethical concept if it is grounded in compulsion or interference from any agent outside of the individual himself. The individual must agree freely to any restriction placed on him for morality to be truly effective. Compassionate love, metta, is the basis for all moral and ethical conduct in Buddhism. Out of this compassion arises all ethical and moral precepts, social service, social justice, social welfare, equality, brotherhood, tolerance, understanding, respect for life, respect for others' views, respect for others' religions. All of these have their roots in compassionate love. And based on the great noble principle Buddhism has always been a religion of peace. Its long history is free from the taints of religious wars, religious persecutions, and the inquisitions. Buddhism, in this respect, stands unique in the history of all religions. Of the Buddha's noble example in this matter, Swami Vivekananda says in his lectures on karma yoga, the whole human race has produced one, but one such person, such high philosophy, such wide sympathy, the great philosopher preaching the highest philosophy yet has the deepest sympathy for the lowest animals and never puts forward a claim for himself. He is the ideal karma yoga acting entirely without motive and the history of humanity shows him to have been the greatest man ever born. Beyond compare, the greatest combination of heart and brain that ever existed. In respect to its social and moral code, the German philosopher, Professor Max Muller, he has said the Buddhist moral code taken by itself is one of the most perfect which the world has ever known. And on this point, all testimonies of hostile and friendly quarters agree. Philosophers, there may have been religious preachers, subtle metaphysicists, 
disputants there may have been, but where shall we find such an incarnation of love, love that knows no distinction of caste and creed or color, a love that overflowed even the bounds of humanity, that embraced the whole of sentient beings in its sweep, a love that embodied the gospel of universal loving kindness, metta and non-injury, ahimsa. Albert Schweitzer says, in this sphere, the Buddha gave expression to truths of everlasting value and advanced the ethics, not of India alone, but of humanity itself. The Buddha was one of the greatest ethical men of genius ever bestowed upon this world. And furthermore, Professor Rice Davids observed that the study of Buddhism should be considered a necessary part of any ethical course and should not be dismissed in one page or two, but receive its due recognition in the historical perspective of ethical evolution. So this is the where we stop for day three. The one piece that I wanted to add was the scientific verification of Buddhism. Probably the most exciting thing, you've heard me say this before so many times, but in the last about 10 years, we have turned ourselves completely over in humanity if they know of this research. Because when we talk about the neuroplasticity of the brain, the flexibility of the human being for change, this changes the position of the psychoanalyst, the psychologist, and the psychiatrist dramatically. So many people in the world point to this other person, this partner, this relationship, this boss, this whatever politician and say, why do they always do that? Why can they just not change? And some people march around saying, oh, people just can't change. The mental health community, this has to be one of the biggest things I thought for sure it was going to get some kind of Nobel Prize sometime, but maybe not. I don't know. But it should have, because all of a sudden, when we look at people stricken by mental health, when we look at the, the, uh, the terrible situation of depressive disorders across the globe, we find the devastation this has caused and the loss of economics and the loss of family and the loss of so much in humanity. We cannot even go near it. It is so devastating. And those were people that were put on drugs because they couldn't change. <laughs> and I'm there. We, now all of a sudden we figure out what our grandmothers told us so long ago and no one wanted to listen. If you have a bad habit, you can change it in 30 days, my grandmother said. Now the research says 66 days. It's priceless. I think it's funny. It's 66 days now for you to do this the same way every day, all the time, wherever you are to change the old habit that's driving everyone crazy into a new habit. And eventually it flips and there you have a new life. And guess what? You changed. <laughs> you changed. And everybody out there never believed you could change, but you changed. Turning over the leaf, turning over the life. Realizing the past is in the past. All these lessons we talk to you about is through and through Buddhism, through and through the suttas in the original teaching. Now you have to tell me, Sarah, are you still here? I don't know if Sarah's still here. Oh, okay. I'm wondering, did you pull did you pull the papers out for this? Can you the papers from your email out for this night? No. <laughs> I haven't got them. Hugh, do you have them? Mm -hmm. We just sent them out just now, a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, Hugh's, Hugh's got them on WhatsApp. What do okay. you need? 
Can you just please tell me in this session, part three, what were the two ad notes at the bottom? One of them was about the, uh, the neurocognitive science and the neuroplasticity of the brain. So this is the big remarkable thing. And Buddhism has said it all along, but the other one, I need to know what was the note, the other ad note at the bottom of the list of topics for today. What was it? Just bringing it up. Okay. <laughs> this is funny, I read you. <laughs> I think it's ad note six. Ad note six. Do you I want to your speaker on for this, Hugh? Maybe five or six, something like that. He's just, I'm just switching off and he'll switch off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, Sister Kima. Hello. Do you know what I said it was? The other ad note? I can't remember the topic and I didn't pull my notes out. <laughs> um, well, I've got the notes here. Um, in, can you speak to speaker off? Yeah, the last topic was the morality. Uh, the Yes, it said ad note. Um, Seven is the gift the Buddha left for us to help us in the modern world. Ad note six was living and dying with grace and dignity. No, no, Ad that's note not right. five was COVID-19, impact by sudden change. No, that's not where we are. I don't know what that is. Just hang on for just one second. I'm going to go look. Hold on. It's the operational impact of virtue. And forgiveness on meditation. Um, just one second. Operational impact of virtue and forgiveness on meditation. Um, Did you get it, sister? Just one second. I'm trying to. Oh God, what is that? Um, What's the one? Oh, oh, I see what I did. Okay. Um, now I'm seeing what I did. What did I send you guys? Ethics and, ethics and society and then morality. Operational impact of virtue and forgiveness. Okay. Virtue and forgiveness was the one that I forgot. The neuroplasticity I already mentioned. Okay. So I can put this away and get back to you. I can. I can't see if I can remember how to do this. <laughs> ah, there you are. Okay. So it was something in forgiveness. What was it? Forgiveness and what? Virtue and forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, when we're teaching you from Dhammasukha, we we are teaching you how he did this how the Buddha actually got to where he went, he, what he found and how he found it and exactly how he did it. And where this is coming from is that if we read the suttas, just get the book and read it. It's not going to really help the person very much, um, especially with the ditto marks, <laughs> you know, because then you don't get any of the skill training because of the ditto marks. But the thing is that he was a meditation teacher and if we go to that book and we read the entire book as understanding he was a meditation teacher and that's how he's explaining things you get a whole different idea from going and studying the texts sutta by sutta by sutta and i've been i have run into so many people who have said it's all according to this sutta number eight or this sutta number 10 this is all of buddhism it's impossible <laughs> it's impossible because you in order to understand almost any of the suttas in the text you need to have the found some kind of foundation in order to understand what they're talking about when they teach you a sutta, you see? So the, 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 the struggle for me was in the educational curriculum and trying to gather things to give people for us to have things to give out in retreats for support was what was that foundation, you see? So when you come to our retreats, normally, you know, when you, when you come to our retreats, you get exposed you honestly do but what did i do with it <laughs> this is funny okay um what did i do with it oh here we go okay 
you always you get you get exposed to a foundation page that has finally gotten put together and it took nearly eight years to to fool around with this thing to figure out in order to understand what he did you have to have the right definitions so the nagging thing for me traveling with Bonte Vimala Ramsey so long and helping him with retreats and traveling and supporting the, the students by putting together things to give them at retreats. Um, the nagging thing about it was that if you don't have the definitions correctly, then they don't fit together. And you don't get to look through that set of glasses to see what it really meant. And so um, I'm fooling around now with the idea of, of, of work. Somebody, people are nagging me for a long time when I say so many things have slipped out of alignment. It's like creating a car, having Elon Musk design a car 1600 years ago and expecting today for that car to work on these roads now and run perfectly on this fuel and run with this oil and everything else after 1600 years. And it, can, it can't be done. It's not going to happen. The car won't operate, you see. So we are in a strange place teaching tranquil wisdom insight meditation. We have retreats and on retreats in person where we can see the people connect with their energy, do the interviews properly. And we, we can really coach you for 10 days. These people make remarkably, really exceptional progress. And they begin to understand because they are taught this foundation information, they're understanding it properly, no matter what sutta we give to them by the end, they're understanding how all these pieces really do fit together. You know, there's many people out there say that the Buddha contradicts himself. He wasn't a good teacher. He did this and that, and it isn't clear at all. And that's why there's so many schools. I have a different opinion. <laughs> I have an opinion that the leaders of the different schools, when they came along, they had good benevolent intentions, but they also had really good personalities and were capturing charismatically people when they explained to people explanations. And that's more powerful than the other part, the other, looking at it the other way. But when we worked really, really hard to put this together, when we give it to you, it's only like two pages long. After all that work, it's only two pages long. So what we're looking at, if you write it down, I'm going to put it in the tips. You know, I'm doing these morning tips now. I'm having fun with this. Can Sister Kama actually teach me something in three minutes? <laughs> it's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> so, so far, the highest one has been three minutes and six seconds, I think. You know, I'm sticking to the law here. So we're taking things like individual top, tiny topics that we learn about and we're putting them out, you know, like explaining to you why this is a good question. Why do we only say these five little couplets when we do the Dhammapada reading in the morning? Why do we have to use those? Uh, five and monks who come to visit us are just going crazy because there's 460 some odd couplets and we're using these five why <laughs> i if i'm there i have no re no no problem telling them we've been to bonte we've asked him if he'll ever change them and he just goes pow you know this is what people need right now if they learn these five it'll change the world <laughs> And he's never going to change it. So we have big monks and middle monks and lower monks come. And they want to have other verses because they know there's all these verses. And we say, no, it's those five. Sorry, we can't change them. Because if, if we could make everybody learn these five, Bonte honestly feels like he'd put a crack in that cosmic egg. <laughs> and it would just crack, you know, and change everything. Well... These words that I mentioned, I'll mention these to you because these are going to be talked about uh, too in the tips. But the first one is the definition of meditation. You get it wrong, no progress, no progress. And um, my, the, this is meditation as a word is one of the big ones that professors in universities are aware of in the Buddhist studies departments. And they know that you cannot learn Buddhism from an English dictionary. It's 
That's it. You just can't. Because that definition isn't there in English for you. And, you know, this has been the meditation and mindfulness, the two words have been tampered with just horribly since the mindfulness movement struck the earth. But that's not from Buddhism. I want to be perfectly stern about this. That's not what was happening in Buddhist meditation. You were observing. <laughs> You are not concentrating on a candle or concentrating on a single object and staring at this on a fence post for an hour until everything around you disappears. It's very interesting what happens with absorption. I've, I've played with it in the forest. I've sat this on a rock and sat in front of it for an hour and a half and stared at it and everything around it goes completely blurry until only this is there and the image is stuck in my mind. That makes me highly developed as an absorption meditator because it gets stuck in my mind. So these are all interesting stuff, you know, but where did that come from? It came from what was happening before the Buddha. And then, but the power of going into the dictionary and changing it from the older dictionaries, you got to go to a library and find one of the dictionaries that's like this big in the library somewhere, and then look it up and look at the the background behind the, the words to find out what the old definitions I'm talking about. And the new definitions that are coming in the new dictionaries are changed. I've watched it happen in the last 10 or 12 years. How it, because we, we are religious attendees to bookstores. <laughs> we love bookstores. Anyway, so meditation is observing the an observation instrument is what it's based on. The second one is, is mindfulness. Uh, well, the, I'm sorry, the mindfulness is the one that's the observation. The meditation is what was the Buddha particularly doing? Very particular. He was observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly the uh, the four noble truths, the dependent origination, and the three characteristics, and how they all come together. You see, he he wanted. What did he teach? He taught what he did. Why? Because he was a meditation teacher, and the only thing he knew how to teach you was to make the decision to teach you how to see what he saw. And it gets very exciting once you lighten up and you're not forcefully depending on an object. He taught you what objects were for. He talked to you about that definition of an object and why it's in the meditation and what it's for. That's in some of the places. The mindfulness was the observation skill and had this remembering talent. And what does it remember? It remembers to remind you to keep watching. It reminds you to keep watching and when you do right effort to remember what it is. And whatever happened to right effort? Right effort needs its own novel written for heaven's sakes. Where did it go? Right effort. And it turned into, when we look it up in the sources, you will start to giggle. You will start to laugh when you look up effort in uh, thesauruses because our definition, it's there, <laughs> it's there. You know, effort, you know, is there, uh, but the, the, it's the old story I've told my students many times when I studied Spanish and needed to know words for a class, I would rush to the Spanish dictionary and look up the word and I would not read all the definitions for Spanish class. I would take the first one, two, and three maybe and I would write that on my test and get an A, okay. <laughs> but the sixth or seventh one down in there for delusion is a good word. That delusion, you, that our definition for delusion is in the dictionary, but you have to go way down to six, seven, or eight in the definition. How many people do you know, be, be honest with yourselves, that go to a dictionary and look up a word and read all of the definitions before you go to class? Come on. You don't do that. You don't do it even in a foreign language. So you, that's why we got lost. So once you get lost in this game, this game is just like learning meditation is like baking bran muffins. <laughs> the bran muffin recipe for the Smith College in, in, uh, the, in, uh, 
you know, in Northampton, Massachusetts, the Smith College had this chef and she came and worked at the rest home that my mother and father-in-law, they owned and we all worked there. So Olive brought us the recipe for the bran muffins and we just love raisin bran muffins. So we took the recipe home and we decided to make it on the farm. And we're going to make these brands. <laughs> and the thing is, we had the fattest pigs that year because we made the brand muffins 11 different times and they kept coming out like mush or like rock, one or the other. They never came out right. And we kept asking Olive, what is the problem with these brand muffins? She said, oh, well, you have to follow the ingredients perfectly. I said, what do you mean we're following them perfectly? And she said, well, what kind of oil did you use? <laughs> and the oil was the secret to the recipe. That's only this one ingredient, one ingredient off, and you get mush or clay or rock, okay? And what it had to do with was a Wesson oil cookbook. It was a Wesson oil cookbook. And if you used Wesson oil with this recipe, oh, they were just fantastic. Oh my gosh, they were marvelous. If you use any other vegetable oil other than Wesson's oil, it's a flop. That's what the meditation reminds me of. If, you're, if your mindfulness is off, just one ingredient, the mindfulness is wrong, it won't work. If your concentration is too hard, we got to work with you for two, three, four weeks to get you to lighten up and balance it because of the loot. It can't be too tight, it can't be too loose, it has to be perfect. You have to tune it or else the whole thing flops, the whole thing. And it really falls apart, you know? I suppose if you use qua uh, quail eggs, which are much smaller than chicken eggs, you're out of luck, it won't work, <laughs> you know? This kind of thing is such a silly thing. You know, a different, a different kind of baking soda or that sort of stuff would just mess everything up. So it's a very touchy thing and unfortunately, um, when people are in a hurry, and I think that's a big part of this in our culture, our society today, we're in a hurry to get somewhere with something. We want instant gratification, yeah? So we don't want to do the work that's necessary to understand something, to incorporate it in our minds in a way it's not going to disappear. And meditation and mindfulness has to be understood. The Four Noble Truths have to be understood and what they were used for. And the requisites for awakening, the 37 requisites for awakening, they need to be understood and how they all work together. And you can't, uh, you know, the biggest saddest part, one of the saddest parts, you know, they call it morality in this article, but what was very funny was <laughs> I was starting to pay more attention and work with the book and go to the index to get information, and I could not find the precepts anywhere. And I'm, come on, how can you not have precepts in your index in the Majima Nikaya? This is true. This is true. You go and look in your book if you have it. You cannot find precepts. It's not there. So I had to work and work. <clears throat> Finally, I called a friend that I knew was going to Bhikkhu Bodhi's class and we talked about this and said, you know, there's an old word that we don't use anymore. Virtue. <laughs> virtue. It's listed under virtue. Now, who would look under virtue? Nobody in today's world would look under virtue. And then you have the 1960s and you expect us to understand the importance of morality or the precepts having to do with your meditation and whether it works or not. And after you've been through the 1960s, you don't want to talk about anything that has the label on it, morality. In the United States, you do not want to bring this up at all. You know, even today we have this problem of just having a discussion about morality because morality is a dirty word and my mother and father can't tell me what to do and neither can my parents or my neighbors or anybody else and I'm going to do what I only please. And that's it. That happened in the 60s. Okay. And now here we are and you don't touch the, the idea of talking to someone about morality. And that's what happened with the mindfulness movement with John Kabat-Zinn. 
he knew all the parts and he knew what the Buddha had created, but he couldn't speak to the medical community because it was illegal for in our country to talk to you in any of your classes in university or medical schools or anything if we talked to you as someone from a religion. Uh, we even kidded around with this one university. We said, look, uh, we want to use your research department if you want. We'll wear white coats over our robes. <laughs> We'll wear wigs if they're too upset. The students we want to use in research, they can't stand being in the room with us because we're bald. We will, we're, we were willing to do this. We'll wear big hats, whatever you want. You know, we just want to do this research and we could not do it in the University of North Carolina because we were Buddhists and we're in a Bible Belt. We should have pursued it, but we didn't. We didn't have time. That's the truth. We were traveling too much at the time to get involved with such silly stuff, you see? So the point is that the foundation for Buddhism on this page is talking about a very simple combination of the five aggregates, the six sense doors, the three kinds of feeling, right? And then you have to take Dana Sila Bhavana, which by the way, they threw out the window a long time ago. They only wanna talk about Sila Samadhi Panya. They do not want to talk about Dana Sila Bhavana. But if you have to talk about generosity, morality, and make that start working as your first bhavana, step in development of your mind. And then when you step over to Sila Samadhi Panya, morality, uh, the Samadhi is the actual practice of the meditation itself and the degree of productivity concentration, collectedness of mind. And the wisdom starts to come because you're training through knowledge and vision. Okay. So I'm talking way too much here. So I want to hear from you now.